My name's David Roos and I'm the Director of Libraries for Hammersmith and Fulham, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea and the City of Westminster, so-called Tri-Borough. We know that people love reading, we know that people like talking about what they're reading and we know that people come to reading groups in the individual libraries across the three boroughs. Uh, to discuss what they've read, to share their thoughts and ideas, and it stimulates people's imagination, it takes them away from some of the crueler realities of day-to-day -day life, but also uh, brings communities together. And what we wanted to do through the Text Tribe was to do that in the virtual environment. What better way than to bring together <coughs> readers who are passionate about reading with writers who are passionate about writing. And I think one of the jobs of libraries is to connect readers with writers. And so I'm absolutely delighted that Mark Billingham has given up his time this evening to come and talk to us, to us about his writing uh, and his crime fiction, a lot of which is set in central North London, uh, so areas that many of us will be familiar with. Hopefully we're not so familiar with some of the, uh, the crime that he talks about. Um, but I think... Uh, what drives Mark to write in, in the way that he does, how he shapes the characters, how he shapes the locations and describes those, is something that we're going to find very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stand up. Hello. Um, thank you for coming out on a, on a miserable night. Um, it's, very, it's great to be part of this, this innovative event, and uh, it's always great to do events in libraries. Um, to, to do as much as we can for libraries in the face of a Philistine government that's trying to close them right, left and centre. Um, like most writers, I wouldn't be a writer if it wasn't for libraries. Um, I didn't grow up in a house with books, um, and if I hadn't been able to go to the library with my mum every week and take books out, I wouldn't be reading, and, and no writer would be a writer if they weren't a reader. Um, it's... Uh, y y you are welcome to tweet, but please don't use that as an excuse to sit there playing Angry Birds. Um, I, know, I know the tricks. I know what you're up to. Um, it's very weird to be, to be part of a book group that's talking about this particular book. Um, I should say that on behalf of crime writers everywhere, uh, I'm here to officially announce that reading crime fiction is better than sex. Um, and it's official. It's absolutely official. They did, they did a survey in one of these women's magazines um, at the beginning of the year, and they asked, you know, thousands of women aged between kind of 20 and 80, and a significant percentage of these women said that reading crime fiction was better than shopping, eating, oddly, um, and sex. Now, as at any literary event, the women in this room outnumber the men by about 10 to 1. Um, so I think I'm on fairly safe ground in saying, way to go, ladies. <laughs> well done. Well, look, it's a silly survey. It doesn't, what can I tell you? I couldn't, I couldn't honestly tell you that reading this book uh, is going to be better than sex. I can promise you it will last an awful lot longer. Um, but it, it, it is odd to talk about this book because it's my, it's my first book. And, and uh, it's a book I haven't spoken about for sort of 13 years. Um, it's a book. It's a book I'm um, exceedingly fond of for a lot of reasons. Uh, I wouldn't be published. It was the first book I had published. Um, it got picked for, for World Book Night this year. It was made into into a TV movie. Um, but it's a book that I'm also hugely ambivalent about. Uh, and maybe some of that will come up if we have a discussion afterwards. I want it to be a discussion because it's a book group. So it's not just going to be me banging on. Uh, I'll talk for a little bit and I'll read for a little bit from the book. Um, but then I'm, you know, I just want to answer some questions and get into a discussion about what you like, what you hate about the book. Not too much about what you hate, obviously. Um, it's, I should tell you a little bit about how, how I kind of came to write it. If we go back to uh, summer of 1999, I was working by night as a stand-up comedian um, and by day as a television writer. And I was quite enjoying stand-up comedy at that time. I grew to not like it quite so much later on. But I was still enjoying that, but I was hating writing for television. Um, writing for television at its best is collaborative, and at its worst is writing by committee. It's a miserable, miserable thing. You write 28 drafts, and something ends up bearing no resemblance whatsoever to the thing you started out writing, and you have to take your name off it. And it's fairly miserable, but it was paying the mortgage, was what I did. But I was devouring crime fiction, which I'd done since the age of 11. Uh, we had a, a, a very crazy maths teacher at my school. It's usually an English teacher that inspires writers, but in my case it was a maths teacher, who got bored during his own lessons. And he would he'd talk to us about calculus or something, about 15 minutes, and then go, God, he was bored as I am. We'd all go, yeah. And he'd dig into this battered leather, ba leather bag and pull out an old tattered copy of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And he read us these Sherlock Holmes stories, and I was just, you know, 
I mean, clearly I was enjoying it more than maths, but I was captivated by these stories. Um, not so much the detail of the stories, you know, I, I can barely remember some of them. You know, there were snakes and hounds and poison and all that, but like the character of Sherlock Holmes, this incredible character, absolutely captivated me, which is explains why I'm a writer and why I can't add up. That's basically what happened. That's how, you know, that's how I was bitten by the bug. And I went out and I then, I'm ashamed to say, shoplifted um, some popular thrillers from WH Smith's in Mosley Village in Birmingham. I'm sorry. Um, life of crime early on. Um, I shoplifted Jaws and The Godfather, right? These two amazing popular thrillers that I read back to back one summer at the age of, I don't know, 14. And I was absolutely not for six. It was the first time that I, I was aware of what fiction could kind of, you know, the power it could have. Because up, up until that time, you read what you're told to read at school. You know, you read, you read great books, but, you know, 1984 or Animal Farm or To Kill a Mockingbird, they're books you read for school, so they feel, feel a little bit like homework. When you go out and you find a book for yourself, that was the first time that I was absolutely grabbed, and then I, I went out and I read Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, and it was just crime fiction, crime fiction, crime fiction. There came a point by 1999 where my wife said to me, you have to find a way to get these books for nothing, or we're getting divorced. Because um, I was a collector, I was a nutty collector. I would collect first edition crime fiction, UK first edition, American first edition, proof copies, reading copies, of taking over the house. So I wrote, and this is a little tip for anybody who wants to get free books, right? I wrote to my local uh, newspaper, which at that time was Ham and High, and I said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm reviewing crime fiction. And I just gave them, a, you know, a made up name of some editor somewhere. And then books just started coming through the letterbox. <laughs> just coming every day. My postman was just hating me, just books. Obviously I had to review a few, so I started reviewing a few crime novels interviewing crime writers. I became part of that community. I suppose today I'd be a blogger. Um, I got to interview writers at that time who have since become friends, people like Ian Rankin, Michael Connolly, you know, sitting there nervously kind of interviewing these kind of he crime writing heroes. So by 1999, the missing piece of the puzzle for me was to sit down and write one. Um, and, I, I, you know, so by that point, I'd written loads of things. I'd written TV scripts and I'd written terrible plays and terrible student poetry. You know, standing out, looking at the rain, listening to the Smiths, writing poems, all rubbish. Um, but I never thought I could write a novel, because a novel is it's like a house brick. I just thought, how could you know? A half-hour TV script is easy. How could I sit down and write one of those? And then I had an idea, which became, ultimately became Sleepyhead. One summer holiday with the family, kids go to bed, I'm sitting outside this villa in Mallorca, wherever it was, my wife's got a glass of wine, i got a cold beer, and I just start scribbling in this notebook. By the end of the holiday, I do some maths, and I figure I've got about 30,000 words, and I go... Hang on a minute, that's about a third of a novel. They're all about 100,000 words long. Maybe this isn't as tough as I thought it was. So I went home and I worked on those 30,000 words and I sent them off to some agents. And two agents said yes. And I'm like, oh my God. And I, I picked one of these agents. She sent it off to all the publishers she knew. Four publishers said yes. And suddenly there's a kind of a, a crazy auction. I remember exactly where I was the moment I knew Sleepyhead was going to be published. I was in a great cross shopping centre. I was being dragged around Brent Cross Shopping Centre, standing outside what is now Wagamama's in Brent Cross Shopping Centre, when my agent called and said, you know, whoever it was which publisher had made an offer. And I knew that this book was going to get published. This book I hadn't finished. This book of which I'd only written 30,000 words. So then I had to go and finish it. And the, actual, the actual idea for the book, for the plot, I'd read this amazing book called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which some of you may have read. It was made into a movie about 10 years ago. Uh, written by a French journalist who had a stroke, and as a result of this stroke, suffered from something called locked-in syndrome, where you can see and hear and feel, you're completely aware of everything going on around you, but you cannot move, absolutely cannot move, except oddly, that you can blink. And he dictated this entire book by blinking. Um, and it was an astonishing book, but I've always, got, always had something of a twisted mind, so I started thinking, I wonder if you could do that to somebody on purpose. At the time, my wife's television director, she was directing Casualty, and she said, oh, you should have a word with our medical advisor, who's this wonderful, eccentric, brilliant neurosurgeon called Dr. Phil Coburn, who became the model for Phil Hendricks in the book. And I went and I said to him, look, this, you know, locked in syndrome, could you do it to somebody on purpose? And his eyes kind of lit up, and he went, that's an evil idea. <laughs> let, me, let me go away and do some research. And he went away and did a bit of research, and he came back to me and he said, you could... You could do it, but it's incredibly difficult. And if you got it ever so slightly wrong, even by a fraction of a millimetre, you'd kill them. And I just went, bing, there's a book right there. 